2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 21. Second Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to the godliness through the knowledge of him who calls by glory and grace, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these we may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the word through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and is forgotten that he has cleansed you after his cleansed from his, he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for privacy, for <laughs> prophecy never came by the will of man, but... <laughs> oh. <laughs> by the will of God. Uh, by, by the will of God. By, by the will of God. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, question number one says, what does it mean to be in verse 1, when it says that the recipients of this epistle have received faith as precious as ours, or another translation, obtain like precious faith with us. What does that mean? So we are right here in the beginning of this particular scripture, and it is written in verse 1, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us. That's a complicated set of words to put together. Or the NIV says, those who have, let me see what the NIV says. Who has the NIV? For those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Okay. What does that mean? Receive a faith as precious as ours or have re- obtained a like precious faith with us. What does that mean? It means the truth. They receive the truth. Okay, now we do have to kind of go to the authorship of the letter, just a little bit. It means it's Jesus and nothing else. It means it's Jesus and nothing else. But if we do look at the author, which, you know, we have to in this case, who is Peter, what do we know about Peter that might make him very different than the people that he's writing to? Oh, well, he walked with Jesus. He walked with Jesus while he was on this earth, while Jesus was on the earth. And he didn't just walk with Jesus while he was on the earth. Even if we look at Peter compared to some of the, and don't like compare, but compared to some of the other disciples, Peter had some really show-stopping experiences from my perspective. Yeah. Show-stoppers. <laughs> Getting out on the water, that's a show-stopper. Being up on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's a showstopper. Preaching and saying, you know, in the the book of Acts, you know, declaring the word of God and watching 3,000 people get saved. That's a showstopper. 
So when he says having received, that does Peter like in a different category than everyone else? Is that, does that mean he's somehow a little bit closer to God? Or that his faith is of a different quality than the measure of faith that each one of us has been given? He was in the chosen three. I mean, he was the best of the best. He was one of the best of the best. He was a group of disciples. Um, hence, he was on the mountain. Um, and very often you see Jesus taking the three, Peter, and Peter, James, and John, to give them special lessons. So that they, knowing, knowing that they would eventually be the leaders of the church and have to pass that lesson on. Okay, so let's, good, let's, let's, let's uh, look at this. If I take everything and distill it down to what I think is the most important thing that's what it says, um, the experiences that Peter and let's say this group of three had, it's not for the person, it's not because they were special, God's no respect of person. They weren't like, oh, I like you the best. It was for their purpose. The experiences or the teachings were not based on the personhood. It was based on their purpose. And so I had a set of experiences in my life. You had a set of experiences in your life. And whatever collection of experiences that you've had, they are for the purpose that God has created you to do on this earth for his kingdom. Does my, me, my set of experiences, because I don't get to be a commissioner, which I so respect commissioner, I know, I'm not going to get to be a commissioner in the Salvation Army. I can pretty much guarantee that's not going to happen. But because I don't get to minister in that way, does that mean that the Lord is loving him more? No. Does that mean that he's received a different kind of faith than what I've received? No. What it means is that his purpose, why God created him, what he was called to do, is just different. It's still all working together to build the kingdom, to grow the saints, etc. It's just different. It's not because of him. It's because of the Lord. We are his vessels. We each have different talents. Um, I can build things. Mm -hmm. small and large but I can build things where someone else takes a hammer and saw and and you don't want to see what comes out of it um, but God uses the talents that we have that he gave us in the first place Absolutely. to do things and um, I envy people who have some of the talents like being able to um, explain God's word so well and to be and to be preachers, my jobs have been the quiet jobs behind the scenes so that the preachers could go out and preach and not have to worry about the, the other side of the coin so much. But God uses what we have so in some sense the gifts and talents we have are what God intends for us to do even though sometimes people will look at it. I have had an officer tell me that my experience at THQ was not a ministry. I beg to differ with you. But um, it was God using what I had to give. Right. So I think what I had done and what she just said is that's to me the, the nice example of Jesus plus. Because to say whatever she was doing at THQ was not a ministry, you're applying some worldly standard to understand what the Lord has asked her to do. There has to be some worldly standard that's being applied there. I knew a woman in Pittsburgh who had a church that had ten members. <clears throat> and those ten members were faithful. Now she was, I mean, she was touching some of everybody in her community. But who would show up on a regular basis? Ten people. Is that a mega church? No, that's not even a mini church. I'm not even, maybe we call that a Bible study. I don't know. <laughs> but it was a powerful work 
And we can't apply a Jesus plus standard. Ooh, you only got ten people. You must not be very successful. When the words that the Lord gave her to speak are still impacting my life 20-something years later. So why do I? So that's Jesus plus. Avoid that. I love what she said also. We're going to keep going. The gifts and the experiences are not based on, you know, being a special person. Because this is the Elohim show starring Jesus Christ. No flesh will glory in his presence. This isn't about us. This is about Jesus. And so those gifts and those experiences, not that God doesn't love us, we're special to him, (laughs) but no one is more special than anyone else, and everything ultimately is funneled into this thing called purpose. And so let me just kind of answer the question there. It says, what does it mean? He's telling his readers, or the readers, that just because I was on the Mount of Transfiguration, with the Lord. Just because I, I I walked with Jesus, I walked on the water, I saw him feed 5,000, I saw all of these things. My faith and your faith, they are the same. Our faith, what we've been given, is the same thing. Because what we have been given is of and by God. Now, Here's where we may see some differences. This is all happening now. Our response to the faith, our response to the experiences, our response to what the Lord is telling us, there we might begin to see some differences. People grow at different rates. Like, I'm so, you know, people grow at different rates. Let's put it like that. Our response, our willingness to let go of our nonsense. Our willingness to, you know, you be, you know, completely faithful to the things that that's where we might see some differences. But the, the gift of faith that we have all received, the gospel that we have all received, that's all the same for everyone who has received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That is the same. Another place where we can mess up. forget that there's a process. You're born a baby into the kingdom of God. A baby. And so we are said, this says desire the pure milk of the word so you as babes might grow. Biological age and spiritual age are not the same. Because if that were the case, <clears throat> if I have a 90 year old who gets saved today, they're 90. And I meet them in the church. I don't even know they got saved yesterday. <clears throat> Are they where, let's say, someone who might be 23 but has been walking with the Lord their whole life, are they in the same place spiritually? It's a problem unless the Lord has done a mighty work that we just don't understand. <clears throat> where do we see the differences? We forget that there may be someone who's in a different denomination at the moment. Let's put it like that. They're not growing, or they're just starting out. The Bible, even when you go to the Greek, makes these distinctions between a technon, which is childlike, and a huios. Like, you know I don't speak Greek, so I'm going to butcher it here. <laughs> which is a mature son of God, slash daughter. So this is where we see differences. The faith that has been given... Is the same. Where you are in terms of being processed, where you are in terms of your response, the diversity of gifts and experiences all toward the purpose that God has created you to be or to do on this earth, that's where we see the differences. Okay. So again, in question number one, he's saying, having received as precious faith as ours, 
We're not special. You got the same thing we got. Don't struggle. Don't don't wonder. We got the, we. Everybody in this room got the same thing. If you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we got the same thing Peter got. We got the same thing John got. We got the same thing that that even we go into the Old Testament. You know, the same kind of thing, as it were. Kind of thing. We'll explain that later. And like Nathaniel, etc. We got the same thing. And God's no respect of persons. So it's the first thing that he says. So the question I ask, this is just kind of like, we don't have to answer this, but we should think about it. Do we ever fall in the trap of thinking other Christians slash denominations have not received the same faith? Other people who are other practicing, do we ever ever fall in the trap of thinking if you are not of the same ilk kind as me, me, you, whoever, it's not the same. It's a little different. Now, do we ever fall in that trap? What we have to say if it borders on being a cult, we might start to think, well, there's some of Christ, but they're doing other things. They're claiming Christ, and the people aren't sure what they're getting. Mm-hmm. And the faith might be the same, but the practice coming out of the faith starts to look a little right. different. And that gets tricky. And we do say, well, maybe these people are in a cult right. or something like that. I want to take the cult and the full-on error off the table. I'm not talking about that. When when I was in the hospital and I had um, various Christians come in and talk with me, they, they were, um, I mean, some came in because they were part of the uh, chaplains at the hospitals I were at, was at. But an awful lot of the staff finding out that I was a Christian would come in to see how I was doing and then pray with me. I didn't ask what denomination they were. Um, I found out that the social worker at at the nursing home I was at happened to be Seventh-day Adventist. And we talked a little bit about the difference between the the churches. But when we got down to the basics, it was Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. We don't have any... My mother grew up Catholic. Her family is Catholic. Um, I've gone to Mass, and once they changed over to English, and I could understand it again. Um, it was amazing how much fellowship we had together. Now, I don't, you know, if we, we don't have the statues of the saints. We don't, you know, we don't put the emphasis on Mary that they put on. But in the center of everything is Jesus Christ. And that's the important thing. I think God made, I've said this before and I'll say it again, I think the denominations are for us human beings because we have different personalities. I am not comfortable in the Southern Baptist Church where everything is hip, hip, hooray, scream, yell, wave your hands in the air. I, that's not my type. Um, I'm very comfortable in the Army where somebody would come in and see this big band at the front and say what is this racket how can I worship with this noise mm-hmm. or I listen to the piano being played and I get blessed and it's God uses our different personalities uh, and d- sometimes the different denominations to fit how we would grow best in Christ mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's not a difference I mean, yes, there are some things that I don't agree with mm-hmm. in some denominations, but the basis, as long as it's centered on Jesus Christ and Him alone, that's the important thing. Right. And so I guess where I want to kind of stay with that, I have that by grace through faith. When someone comes to Jesus and they ask Him to be their Lord and Savior, you know, when I deal with someone who may. And I'm not even talking about seven day events. I'm just talking about someone else who would say they're a believer or a Christian. I just really want to make sure they've had a, a conversion experience. That's the most important thing to me. Have you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? Because that's our first and common starting point. And then as we talk 
and as we ask other questions, then one can say, oh, got it. Let me be super sweet to you so I don't end up, you know, spiritually hurting your feelings because I know I'm going to pray that the Lord will show you the truth in that area so you can push on from that or that, so you can continue to grow in this particular area. And, and even if we take out everything that is different from Protestantism, we still find these differences, but we want to make sure that we're not saying, oh, this one, that's not exactly the same faith as us. If they come to Jesus, and ask them to be their Lord and Savior, they may just be a little tech knot right now. This is not what makes me a believer. You know, I've never worn this before, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> On special occasions. <laughs> so what, you got saved over there? <laughs> right, exactly. That's my point. <laughs> Love that. Okay? That's my point. <laughs> No, I was a believer when I first showed up in this church. Yeah. Okay, and I wasn't even a salvationist when I first sh showed up in this church. Okay, and so that's really, and I'm still me. And then have all of these experiences and things that the Lord has done that have, however, reason by the whatever has put me here to do a work by the power of the Holy Spirit for Him. When I lived in Pittsburgh, just going back to that, and we're going to keep going, you know, the work I did was clean the toilets. I, I just enjoyed that. Not that I like cleaning toilets, but to me, that's a very simple and easy way to serve. Somebody has to clean them. And so when they had the ministry of who's going to clean and clean up the church, I was like, I will sign up for that because that's easy. All right. Let's keep going. Um, we've all received the same quality. The genuineness of our faith. That's what the trials, they show us the genuineness of our faith. We have that same genuine faith as what Peter was given, as what John was given, as what James was given, as what everyone else has been given. We have the same thing. And so question number two says... What does it mean that believers have, quote, received a faith? <coughs> We didn't think it up on our own. We did not think it up on our own. What does it mean when it says believers, you have an extra copy of the lesson, have received a faith? <clears throat> what does that mean? Let's go back and look at that verse. <laughs> to those who have obtained or received a faith, what does that mean? <clears throat> Well, but it's a two it's a two part thing. I mean, yes. Not only do we receive, but we have to accept it at the same time. Excellent. And so that's excellent. <coughs> because again, we're talking to believers who are under attack from false prophets. Or, or false teachers or whatever. So they're being said, you've received, you have received the same thing we've gotten. It's a gift of God. The ability to believe comes from the Lord. But we also have to respond once we accept the gift of life by grace through faith. Then we also have to acknowledge and then respond to what we have been given in continuous growth and development. So by grace through faith, we've received the faith. But in that receiving, you know, you know, you know, our anniversary was earlier this month. Addington put a little bag out there. I didn't just look at it and say thank you. I tore into it. <laughs> and so it's like you don't just receive it. You then have to tear into, interact with, delve into, unpackage all that comes along with this gift. Ability to believe. How about this? Ability to believe what? Eyes have not seen nor ears heard the things that we have been given the grace and the faith to believe. They are beyond our comprehension. Yes. 
And the, and the same note, and jumping down just a bit in verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. Yeah. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. So, so the, there again is our responsibility uh, to, to yes. take what we receive right. uh, wholeheartedly and obey it. And that is what is at the crux of chapter 1, what we're reading right now. It is not just that you receive the, the faith, you receive the gift, and then by that, the gospel and Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There's the other side where you receive, but you begin to open, unpackage, interact with, study, so on and so forth. Okay, let's keep going. It says, in, according to verse 3, how are we able to possess all things that pertain to life and godliness? First of all, what is meant by life and godliness here in verse 3? It says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of the Lord of, and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. What's the life and the godliness that's being spoken of there? What's the life? Spiritual life. It is talking about not bios, but it is talking about Zoe, which is spiritual life. Bios is I'm alive. If I were alive and an unbeliever, I would have bios, but I would not have Zoe. Zoe is spiritual life. So alive on the outside, dead on the inside. This is talking about alive on the inside, alive on the outside. Okay? And godliness. So we can actually look at our necessary Greek here. This word Zoe means the principle of life in spirit and soul. Different than bios because it expresses the highest and best, which is Christ, and which he gives to the saints. It is the highest blessedness of the creature. That life. The highest blessedness. Sure. So um, I have the New Living, and it says, As we know Jesus better, his divine power gives us everything we need for living a godly life. He has called us to receive his own glory and his goodness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And this godliness, it is a devotion or a piety toward God. So godliness of the whole, of true religion, it's talking about... Um, it, the, the godliness is more so a directional statement. The word that's translated there, it's talking about keeping your eyes on, on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It's talking about a direction of that worship or of our attention. Letting go of all distraction. So there's life, which is the highest state, but then there is also godliness, which refers to our own attitude our own um, assimilation, as it were, of, of what we have received the faith toward God and how that is expressed in how we live and how we think. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> how do we, the question is asking, how are we able to obtain all things? That pertains to life and happiness. Go to Bible study on Sunday morning. Right. <laughs> <laughs> How are we able to do that? What does it say in verse 30? Okay, number one, his divine power. We don't cook this up. It's his power. We, we, don't, we don't study and say, oh, I got it. We do do that, but we don't figure it out. He reveals it to us, his divine power, and what else is in verse 3? So it's not just his divine power, but there's something else. Again, just like with the faith. The faith is there, but you got the gift is there, but you got to unpackage it. His divine power is there, but you have to have knowledge. You have to have knowledge of it. The divine power is there. But you have responsibility in it also which is through the knowledge of him. Through the knowledge of him. This word knowledge is actually different. There are two different words for knowledge, uh, two Greek words that are being translated as knowledge. <clears throat> verse 3 and verse 8 are talking about one part of knowledge, which is meaning clear and exact. It expresses a more 
thorough participation in the object of knowledge. Let's think about that. A more thorough participation. What's the object of knowledge in this particular scripture? In verse 3. What's the object of knowledge? Jesus is the object of the knowledge. <laughs> Jesus is always the right answer. That's right. <laughs> but Jesus is the object of knowledge, and it means having a clear and exact knowledge of the object, which is Jesus. How do we get a clear and exact knowledge of Jesus? By stepping the by and by his divine power. Divine power. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to throw in our experience with him. Yeah. I'm going to say no. And yes. Oh, you know what? I'll use a word I like to use in my other class. It depends. <laughs> And the reason why I say it depends is because until our mind is fully, fully, absolutely purified and renewed, it can be very difficult to sort out what is Cynthia and what is pure Jesus. Pure Jesus. Pure Jesus. As I told you guys a couple of weeks ago, you may be going through a trial and rebuking the enemy, and the Lord is like, no, that's the rod of chastisement. <laughs> so you can't rebuke the enemy when I got the rod out. That's not going to work. It's not going to make that stop. Okay, so as our it depends. This is where discernment becomes very important because our experiences might not be meeting that safety test in terms of purity. We we are born in the sewer. We grow up in the sewer. We still got a stink on us. You get close enough to me, you'll smell the stink. You'll see it. Okay. But I'm asking the Lord every day to help me, touch me, heal me, fix me. So I'm less stinky to not just you, but more so to him. Okay. So, but at the same time, our experiences, the Lord uses, I don't know how he does it in your life, but in my life he uses a lot of object lessons. I'm going to build on what was said earlier. I one time sat in a Catholic church and I just was like, ugh, so arrogant Oh, empty rituals, empty rituals. And the Lord said, rituals are only empty when you are. Mm -hmm. Bam. What can I say to that? You can't roll yourself into a Catholic church and, oh, they're not the same. It's an empty ritual. It's only empty when you are. That's what the Spirit of the Lord said to me. And I had to really check myself in that moment. Okay. So... Yes. Our experiences can help us to know Christ. They can help us to more actively participate and understand who he is when we recognize um, what the Lord is teaching us in a particular thing. So our, it depends, and that's why I say it depends, because you've got to really be clear on when it's the Lord and when it's you or when it's the world or when it's somebody else trying to help you understand whatever experience you're having. That's where discernment is so important. All right, let's keep going. So we are able to possess all things, not 75% of them, not 50%, not 99.9%. We are able to obtain all things things pertaining to spiritual life or the highest state of blessedness and godliness according to his divine power. This is not something that we hope to be able to do. This is something we are already able to do when we recognize what needs to be done. Okay. So let's ask the question in number four. It says, again, Christ has given believers everything we need to live godly and holy lives. What are some of the things Christ has given believers to help them or to help us or to help you live a holy life? What, 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 I mean, how do we live a holy life? First, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And, and to even live a holy life, because 
here's where I want to kind of like uh, pick on His Holiness again. Anybody who has attended class and he knows about His Holiness. Is His Holiness living a holy life? That's the Dalai Lama. They call mm-hmm. him His Holiness. Is he living a holy life? I know that I don't think that he's accepted Christ as his Savior. Thank you. He lives a good life. There is not good with that. And a man cannot do a good thing outside of God. We might the world might say it's a good thing. <clears throat> the world might say it's a good thing, but the Bible says you cannot do a good thing. No, not one. Outside. There is none good. You have to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior first. That's the first step to being able to live a holy life. Now, the world may look at others and say, Oh, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, His Holiness. No, I say His, you need to be saved, Miss. And someone needs to bring the message to Him so that He can then live up to whatever this designation He's been given. So, receiving Christ is step one, coming into the kingdom of God. And then. The presence of the Holy Spirit on the inside that is absolutely necessary, absolutely necessary to being able to live a holy life. I have a couple of scriptures here, but we won't go to them right now. But what else? The fruit of the Spirit. Okay, so I will go to them for one quick minute. In Ephesians, I mean, in, uh, that night, in John chapter 14, around verse 26, The Lord is talking about the Holy Spirit and he says he will will bring all of my words back to your remembrance. How do you live a holy life? You know, at Addington, I like to go to this restaurant and the woman who runs the restaurant doesn't do math very well. And Addington's like the human calculator. So she always gets it wrong and he always has to correct her because she's trying to undercharge us. And so he said to me this last time, she has always tested me. <laughs> but the Lord always brings back, to, uh, you know, this is how we do. We let people know when they've made an error mathematically so you don't inadvertently steal. But the Bible says thou shalt not steal. But he sees it for, you know, maybe for what it is, maybe not. Maybe she's just not good at math. But the Lord is reminding him, this is who you are. You don't take the $5 just because you can, just because nobody noticed. And say, uh, if it's a pity, take it back. Because it doesn't belong to you. Okay? So the Lord will bring back, not just in a simple case like that, but in all cases. He will bring back to our remembrance the words that have been spoken. How do you live a holy life? You embrace those moments of continuous sanctification. And those moments of continuous sanctification are, okay, I have a decision point. Do I go with what the world says? Do I go with what the devil says? Do I go with what the Lord says? The Lord says, I said this. And you say, even if I don't want to, I'm going to go with what the Lord says. Okay. Okay. All right. I think you also get this community, or I think it's maybe it's Hebrews 10, where they're talking about, you know, the church to spur one another on in yes. fellowship. And yes. Community is so important to living a holy life. There are so many of us who might be modeling you know, some aspects. <laughs> I say that because nobody here is holy sanctified. I mean, if you are, come to your house. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is nobody here is holy sanctified, but you may be modeling aspects of what holy living, moral living looks like, and other people are watching you, whether you realize it or not. Your children, your grandchildren, your great grands they're looking at you. Hopefully there's consistency in the private behavior too because sometimes people think that others are watching and the behavior is the model behavior when people are watching but in their private lives they're making it private because you know it doesn't exactly look the same. That's a great point because in Hebrews we know that they say don't be like somebody who looks at themselves in the mirror and turns away and forgets what manner of man you are. You deceive yourself when you do that. In other words, I'm saying, yep, this is me. I look at myself. I see the Bible. That's me. And then when I get home, I go do the the naughty thing. Or I go and, you know, I'm not living up to that. I'm deceiving myself into thinking I'm growing in holiness. Got to be consistent. Anything else that we've been given as believers 
by his divine power to be able to walk out, let's say, the longest stretch of the journey, which is sanctification? I would say grace. Grace, whenever you recognize that you have something that you don't deserve, you can awe in that. I don't even deserve this. Mm -hmm. It encourages you to share with somebody else. I have something I don't deserve because I think when you receive grace, you can't be selfish. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what's the point of the grace? It's Mm -hmm. just like a private gift. Grace is given so that you can go and speak to others Mm -hmm. about the goodness of God. Mm -hmm. And grace is also given so that you won't have to enter into the sin. So you can appropriate the grace ahead of the sin. Lord, help me not to do. Lord, help me to say the right words, etc. As opposed to the grace on the other side of the sin, which is, ooh, messed up again, Lord, forgive me. Both are grace, but which side of the act will you appropriate it on? All right. <clears throat> According to verse 4. How are we able to be partakers of the divine nature? promises are sure. Can someone give me an example that through these, these exceedingly great and precious promises, can someone give me an example of what one of those promises might look like? I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Absolutely. That's exceedingly great and precious promise. How is that so exceedingly great and precious? Well, I don't see Jesus standing next to me right now. But he never has left me. He has never forsaken me. And so even though if I were trying to explain that to someone else, it would be hard for the natural mind to get that. But I know for a certainty, if I make my bed in heaven, he's there. When I've been playing in hell, he's been there saying, come on, let's get out of here. Okay? That's, that's my mind. Exceedingly great and precious promise. What's another one? <laughs> yes. Just getting up out the grave. <laughs> the Lord being raised from the dead and he's saying, I'm going to my Father to prepare a place for you. That, you know, I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you so that we can be together. That's, that's my Bible. So if he's saying he's going to prepare a place for me, you know, are we speculating on the housing market in heaven? <laughs> he's preparing a dwelling place for us. That's my bodily. He's also constantly <coughs> praying for us. That's my bodily. Another promise. How do we know? What are these exceeding promises that allow us to partake in the divine nature? And we do like Holy Spirit. Excellent. The fact that the Holy Spirit is on the inside, that he will be with you and he will be in you. He will lead you into all truth. I was going to say that. (laughs) That's another one of those where we have to take advantage of what the Lord has provided for us. The promise is there that he'll lead us into all truth, but we have to ask the Lord, show me the truth. Help me to understand the truth of this situation so that we can have clarity, knowledge, clear, clear knowledge about what's going on. Okay. So, the Holy Spirit with us. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. That's a promise. 
If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things are new. If I'm going to be a partaker in the divine nature, I must understand that even if I'm not acting like it yet, old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. These are promises. All right, I'm one minute over. I did not intend to do this. Um, save your lessons. Because this thing is so rich, we have to keep going with just this. Maybe I'll add a little bit more from next week, but we've got to finish this one up. So let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would pour out your grace upon us. I pray, Father God, that you would lay your hands upon us, Lord. I pray that you would touch us, Father God, in the inner man, Lord God. That you would draw us unto you, Father God. That you would give us such a passion and a love and a desire to be in your presence, Lord. Help us, Father God. Give us, help us to know what has been given, Lord. And help us to know who you are, Lord. Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to study your word. And I thank you, Lord, that you have not left us orphans, but you have come to us, Father God, by the power of your spirit, and you are with us. Help us to grow in our understanding of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.